Reminiscences of Sault Ste. Marie, 1815, by George Johnston. Read by Frank Blissett. In the year 1815, about the middle of June, there appeared emerging in sight, from a point at the head of the Little Rapids, a distance of about two miles from the falls of St. Mary's, three neatly painted yawls. The leading one was well manned by eight expert oarsmen and one steersman. The other two boats had each six oarsmen and one steersman, following in the wake of the leading boat. They were all carrying at their stern the American banner, with its eagle, stripes, and stars waving gracefully in the wind as the boats ascended the river and as they passed before our house we observed many passengers, and some apparently of note, wearing the military frock coat, and which indicated that they were officers of the United States Army. They landed on the common at the present military site of Fort Brady, and soon a large marquee and other tents were put up, forming a neat and orderly camp. My late father and I walked up to the new camp and soon recognized Captain Knapp of the United States Revenue Cutter and Samuel Abbott of the island of Mackinac, and those gentlemen introduced us to General Brown and to his suite of officers, and soon after the introduction my father invited the general and all the gentlemen composing the party to our house and to what he termed his bandbox, and to render them such civilities as their rank and as gentlemen entitled them to, it being late in the afternoon when they landed. They all were invited to tea, and in the meantime the party visited the rapids and the upper end of the portage, from whence they could see the summit of Cape Iroquois, the entrance of Lake Superior. There was at this time a very large and numerous assemblage of Indians at the foot of the falls, and on an eminence was situated the ancient village of the Chippewas considered as a metropolis during the summer months, and where the Indians living on the southern and northern shore of Lake Superior and its interior portions of the country, congregated to meet on friendly relations, and to spend their time in amusements and in the performance of their grand medicine dance and to enjoy the abundance of the rapids, yielding such a plentiful supply of whitefish to warrant sufficient daily food for such assemblages, and at this time the Indians were lords of the soil, free and independent, and fierce as the northern autumnal blast. At this time the Indians were numerous, and yet still hostile to the Americans, from the fact of their having lost many of their friends and relatives during the war with England which broke out in 1812. Their wounds were not yet healed, nor was their aversion to the American name lessened, and at this epoch, and under existing circumstances, the least pretext would have called forth the tomahawk and scalping knife to avenge the deaths of their relatives killed in the war. Agreeably to the invitation given to the general and his suite, the gentlemen made their appearance at the appointed time, and taking their seats around the table, the entertainment commenced, and soon after, while the gentlemen were still at the table, the late Mr. Nolan, an aged trader of over sixty years of age, was announced, and he was desired to walk into the room and take a seat. But the old gentleman appeared very much excited, and before he took his seat, related to my father, in the French language, that he had come to report to him certain facts that had recently come to his knowledge through a friendly Indian woman, who had come to his house by the back way, so as not to be seen by anyone in the Indian village, 
and whom he had left, and was still waiting at his house, related and made known to him that the Indians at the village had in the course of the afternoon, or immediately after General Brown's landing, assembled in a secret council, and the result of their deliberations was to attack the Americans in the course of the night and massacre the whole of them. As the information was rather of a serious and alarming nature, the whole of which was explained and laid before General Brown, and my father offered to the general and his party a shelter in our house, and which offer the general declined accepting for the present, stating that he and his party had come to visit the entrance to Lake Superior, and as hostilities had ceased between England and her Indian allies and the United States, and that he had come in good faith and unprepared with arms, but if he had arms to arm his men and party, he would prefer remaining in his camp. We had fortunately at this time received our goods from Montreal, and over ten boxes of fine and northwest guns, designed for the Indian trade. With these we armed the general and his party of forty-five souls, and supplying them with an ample quantity of powder and balls, they set guards and occupied their tents. I had orders from my father to take with me Mr. Holliday, then a clerk in our service, and a number of half-breeds and Canadians in our employ, and to keep a sharp lookout during the night, and to take our position between the general's camp and the Indian village, and if any Indians dare pass us to shoot them down. We kept to our post during the night, and as the dawn of day appeared, we retired home, passing the general's tent. I informed him that we had not discovered the least movement among the Indians of the village, but at the edges of the woods we had heard repeated sharp sounds of the Indian whistle. The Indians were no doubt aware that the general and his party were prepared to receive them, and consequently gave up the attempt of the contemplated surprise and massacre. The gentlemen were all invited to take breakfast with us, upon fine bouncing white fish, just caught by our fishermen, and while at breakfast, my father dissuaded the general and his party from visiting Lake Superior, as it was considered most prudent under existing circumstances. Soon after, the general's camp was struck down, and the party were in their boats to join the revenue cutter, in waiting at Muddy Lake. That was... Reminiscences of Sault Ste. Marie, 1815, by George Johnston. Read by Frank Blissett.